All right, good evening, everyone. This is Celso Batalha, Astro 10, Evergreen Valley College. This is a summer intense course in Introduction to Astronomy. We are uh, focusing on Chapter 2, Things You Must Do. On June 20 and 21st, what's so cool about June 21st? Solstice, summer solstice, which is a cool thing that has been celebrated for so many thousands of years. Um, especially if you associate ancient cultures, cultures they're, they're believing in a sun god. And uh, so in the summer is when the sun god is uh, the highest number of hours um, above horizon. So you can see the sun um, much more hours than in any other day throughout the year. And also is when um, it's warm. So especially if you live in high latitude regions, that's not a good thing. What is going on here? I might have touched something funny. Sorry about that. And uh, so June 21st marks the summer solstice, and, and that is the point in Earth orbit around the sun. And um, I could maybe bring about the animation two point four season simulation the best oh my flash is not updated sorry about that That gives some idea. Um, so in this animation, um, this is time. If I stop here, so uh, this yellow line represents the. By the way, so yesterday in the classroom we mentioned celestial sphere. So celestial sphere is does not exist, right? But uh, it's a nice way to represent position of stars in the sky. And we can use a hypothetical celestial sphere surrounding us to determine the location and places where stars are supposed to be located. And we divide the celestial sphere in 66 regions. And we call these regions constellations. Now, uh, this blue -ish sphere represents something like that. But um, in, in this representation, you have somebody that happens to be standing on the floor, and the floor appears to be, this green floor appears to be flat. So we know our planet Earth is not flat, it's a round thing. And so this flat uh, circumference, in fact, uh, represents our horizon. So, which means the, the farthest you can see uh, without any impedance of trees and mountains and, and, and houses. So, if you could go to the top of a cliff and look towards the ocean, so the point in the ocean where water and sky would meet would determine your horizon. So, uh, in this horizon, you can establish north, south, east, and west, the major location. And what we are seeing here is this. So, let's go to... Uh, March 21st, which is uh, one of the equinox. So in March 21st, look at this. The sun rises almost due east, and it's going to be setting almost due west, right there. See that? Which means in equinox, the sun's radiation is illuminating both hemispheres 
uh, of our planet in an equal basis, north and south, um, in, in, in with the same percentage of illumination. Now, what boils down to somebody in any given location on Earth is that in these days, the sun is r rising due east. So if you can divide your horizon in, 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 in in, in specific directions, and two of these directions are east and west, then then in an equinox, this is going to happen. So if I go to uh, September 22, 23rd, the same thing is true. Look at that. The sun, which is the yellow dot, is rising pretty much east and is setting pretty much west. Okay, right there. Now, we are in June 21st, somewhere, don't I have a date? I should have a date here. June 21st. So in June 21st, if I try to run the daily motion, which we saw yesterday, which is caused by Earth's rotation on its axis of rotation, the sun rises in its most northeast part of the sky. And the sun sets in its most northwest part of the sky. And the sun hits the maximum height with respect to your zenith point. The zenith point is a point straight up. So no matter where you are on Earth, you look straight up, you define the zenith point. So at noon, in summer solstice, the sun hits the maximum height possible, um, which means it's the point that is closest possible to the zenith. And therefore, the combination of these two effects, so you have the sun uh, longer uh, during daytime, and in addition, you have the sun's rays falling more directly over the floor, and therefore transferring more energy per square inch, so we have summer hot. If you go to the winter, December 21st, in fact, let me go to noon. Let me put the sun in noon so you can see what I mean. There you go. That is noon right there. Close to noon. See if I can. There you go. So you place the sun there, and then you go to December 21st. So I'm moving. I'm not changing the hour, but I'm changing the day. See, the sun is much lower in respect to the maximum, in respect to your zenith. The sun is much lower in the horizon. So the sun rises more towards uh, the, the, the quadrant east-south. Instead of uh, northeast, it's more east-south. And it reaches maximum height in the sky, uh, not so far far from from due south position and sets in the western sky in the southwest position. In a number of hours, the sun stays up and above horizon are much lesser than it is in June 21st, somewhere in there. So let's uh, just check and see one one interesting thing here. So we are close to the summer solstice. Stop there. So it's a uh, time of the day is 5:12, right? So 5:12, about five o'clock, and the sun is setting at seven. So five to seven is what? Uh, seven plus this is almost eight o'clock. So 15 hours. So the sun is above the sky or above horizon about 15 hours. So let's go to December and let's do the same exercise. The sun is going to rise at, oh, let's say 9 o'clock, right? 9, 9 o'clock at that particular latitude, 40 degrees. So rise at 9 o'clock and, and sets. at about 8 o'clock. 
So uh, how many hours that is? It's 8 plus 3, 11. 11 hours in respect of 15. So in the summer, the sun stays up more hours than it is in the winter. We all know. Uh, so right now is what? 720 and it's still pretty much bright out there. Okay. Now, what is causing seasons? Seasons is caused by Just a second. The seasons are called caused by Earth revolution around the sun. Ah, oh, that's not the animation I want to pick. So uh, take, for instance, Earth orbiting the Sun and the axis of rotation with an inclination with respect to this orbital plane. So when Earth happens to be at this location, uh, the axis, the, the, the North Pole, is tilted towards the Sun, and then we call that moment the summer solstice. It's called winter solstice when the North Pole axis is tilted away from the sun. But look at down there. The, uh, the southern pole is tilted towards the sun. So in the same time, the same day of the year, let's say in December 21st, we experience here in the northern hemisphere winter solstice. Whereas in the southern hemisphere, they are <coughs> excuse me, experiencing summer solstice so the seasons are reversed and seasons are caused by earth axis of rotation inclined in with respect to to earth orbital plane now uh, today uh, in addition to that or in addition to those animations uh, chapter two also explore the moon's phase and uh, the most phases are uh, caused by the fact that we have a, a unique source of light in our solar system, and that is the sun. The fact that Earth has a satellite, that is the moon, the moon goes through phases because the moon itself orbits Earth. Then in different uh, times of the month, we have we have the moon, a uh, bright hemisphere, casting a certain percentage of it towards Earth. So let me see if I can make sense of what I'm talking about. So if you look at the sunlight, Earth, and the moon, see that? So the moon is orbiting Earth, and at the any given part of its Earth, or at the any given part of its orbit, it, it has half of its hemisphere light. See that? So it's always 50% lit. So it's 50% lit here, it's 50% lit there, here, everywhere. Same with Earth. So no matter how Earth rotates and go through its phase of daily or diurnal motion, Earth is always 50% lit by the sun. And the reason to that is Earth and Moon don't have proper light. So the only source of light we have in our solar system is, is the Sun itself. Oh, by the way, in midterm number one, I will have several questions that has to do with the Moon phases and the ability you have to determine at what time of the day certain Moons are supposed to rise and set. And uh, probably not today, but I will upload a video that can give you some tricks on how, how to, to do that easily, very easily, okay? But before, I would like you to invest some time studying the moon's phase, 
memorizing them, being able to locate a moon in the sky and say, okay, that is a boxy moon, this is a wany moon, and, and then go from there. Oh, by the way, these chat rooms, unless you, you ask me to lecture on something, what I would try to do the most I can, especially if I have the visualizations and the animations in place, I would try to complement what is given in the book with animations, with the simulations. And, and then I will kind of a play around, assume that you read the book and you, you, you know something about it. Um, unless you ask me to, okay, can you please explain specifically this topic? And then I would be happy to, to do that. Okay, so in this animation again, you have the sunlight, you have Earth, and you have the moon. And what I'm saying is, no matter, no matter um, which position of uh, its orbit Earth is in respect to the sun, no matter which position of its orbit the moon is, is in respect to Earth, this, both objects are always half lit by the sun, okay? Because they don't have proper light, the sun is the one with proper light. Now, what I will do now, I will uh, show time. There you go. So when, when I enable time to be given, then it becomes clear that if you are looking from north perspective down the solar system, this position over here represents noon, right? This position here is sunset, midnight, and sunrise. So Earth rotates from the north part of the sky, as you see now. Uh, Earth rotates on its axis of rotation in a counterclockwise direction. And this counter, uh, yeah, in a counterclockwise direction and we call uh, this motion prograde. And also, uh, Earth goes around the Sun in a counterclockwise direction, right? It, it, it moves around the Sun in a counterclockwise direction. And if, if you are observing the system from North perspective, so that's what I mean right here, see that? This is a counterclockwise direction. So at noon, uh, this little person is here in the equator this is pretty much uh, North Pole. And then six hours later, that person is here. Six hours later, that person is there. Six hours later, is there. So in 20 hour, 24 hour cycle, this person has gone through entire Earth rotation back to that point over there. Okay. Now, how about the moon's phase? So let's think, think about the moon. The moon goes around the Earth, and when the moon is in the far side of its orbit in respect to the sun, that is when the bright hemisphere, see that the bright hemisphere, is totally facing Earth. And if somebody can see this bright hemisphere, this is called full moon. And the moon keeps orbiting Earth, and then about 14 days later, it happens to be in the line connecting uh, uh, or close to the line connecting Earth and the Sun. And when this happened, uh, we don't see any of the bright part of the Moon's hemisphere. Because this bright part is reflecting sunlight in all directions except towards Earth. See that? And then we can't see the Moon. So the only phase, the only single phase that we don't see anything of the moon in the sky is the new phase. And the reason to that is the new phase is in a, in a, in a configuration that reflected sunlight is being sent outward in, in a direction that not includes, does not include Earth. But a few days later, when Earth is uh, somewhere away from that point of the new phase, we see a little bit of its bright hemisphere. Not a lot, but we see a little bit. And we call that phase crescent. So this word waxing means all the phases that lie between the new phase and the full phase. Those are waxing phases. But when we go from the moon to the new 
the phases are called waning, waning phases. So the moon goes from waxing to waning phase in a period that takes about 30 days, 29.5 days. Uh, just, a, uh, just a second. So, uh, walks into any winning phase, right? So, look at this little person here. This little person, uh, look up to the sky and see no moon because the new moon you can't see. But how about the new, the first quarter, the so-called first quarter phase? The first quarter pers uh, phase, that person see it's rising, rising at about noon. It is high up in the sky at sunset. And it sets, and it sets at midnight. See that? So at midnight, you look at this diagram over here. At midnight, uh, that person can't see the moon anymore. And then the moon is in oblivion in that phase. But then the next day, you see that moon coming up. See that? At noon time. It is noon because in this diagram, the sun is in the highest point of the sky. So, what would I recommend? How would I recommend you to study the moon's phase? So, let me call uh, the book here. And then we can go over. Uh, in fact, I think I can. I can pull the PowerPoints directly or the pictures directly from here just a second. So we go arguments. So we saw this part yesterday, and now with the moon's phase. So the moon, the moon's phase goes through eclipse. When the moon is in the full phase, the moon is in the full phase, and it goes into Earth shadows. And as it goes into Earth shadow, it can display either penumbral eclipse or umbral eclipse when it goes into Earth umbra. In which case the moon gets this copper uh, type of coloration as a result of refraction of the sun rate in our atmosphere. Now this chapter also deals with uh, the transition from ancient astronomy to modern astronomy. Uh, and for that let me explain what is prograde and retrograde motion? See, retrograde motion that is discussed in, in this chapter. If you bring this, and oh, by the way, the moon is in the sky. If you go to the, to the window now, if you have a window facing south and look out there, if any of you have there, have that, you might be able to see a nice gibbous moon out there. It's kind of a gibbous, it's more than first quarter. It's a waxing moon, and 
and is um, pretty much close to the south. But what I want to show is as a result of daily or the you know, motion of Earth rotation, the sky drifts slowly from the eastern part of the sky to the western part of the sky. Right, so that's not a problem. But what I'm going to do now is, is stop Earth rotation. So imagine you could stop Earth rotation and then take yourself away from the Earth's surface and then stay hovering in space looking outside of Earth, ignoring Earth rotation. And that's what I will do now with this simulation. So, and I also get rid of daylight. And I will bring the ecliptic, that is the sun's, uh, the sun's path in the sky um, at any given um, uh, time of the year. So the moon is there. We have the ecliptic. Uh, Jupiter is in the sky, which is interesting. Let me go label planets. Let me go label planets and moons. So planets, the moon is there, and the sun is not visible. But uh, take a look at some constellations. Let me see if we can identify some constellation in the sky that we like. For instance, Leo. This is Leo right there. See Leo, this looks like a quotation mark inverted, right? So what what, what means is you go one day at a time and we are again outside earth looking for uh, leo and virgo we are looking at that particular uh, sky region and we are ignoring earth rotation basically okay so if we do this type of things um, what we perceive is that there is a distinction and in fact thousands of years ago uh, stargazers were able to detect that there is a very clear distinction between the moon planets like Jupiter here and the stars and that is if you give enough time the planets the Sun even the comets as you just saw one there so the Sun the planets the moon they have to have they happen to have independent motion that does not apply to the stars. So see the months and the days are going wild right here. Which means if you could go out in space and look to the celestial sphere and then devise and spy a given constellation like Leo. And then you open your eyes and then one day later, approximately one day later, you close your eyes. I'm sorry. You open your eyes and then you close and then one day later you open again and then you close. So if you keep doing this um, uh, consecutively, so what you find is the constellations are all in the same place, but you see planets and the sun and the moon kind of a passing by in a weird way. So since you know that Earth orbit the sun, you know what, what this represents. So in other words, if I go uh, to the deep space simulation we saw, uh, yesterday, let's see if I can pull that up. It's right here. So imagine that you are uh, pretty much hovering around Earth, but you keep looking at Orion, this, this constellation here, Orion. Always, right? So you're going to see here and there the sun passing by Orion, like now. Right? And now you don't see anything passing besides asteroids. And let's see, pretty, pretty much, pretty soon Venus will pass by. Okay, now Venus is passing in front of Orion. And the sun too, and Mercury too. See that? So that's the perspective of somebody 3,000 years ago observing the sky. They, they note that, let me go back here. They note that
Yeah, so let me take the labels, planet. They note that if you allow for a daily or diurnal motion, Earth rotation, for instance, now Earth is rotating, and then you know there is this display, this motion from east to west, and they didn't know what it was, but they thought that all the stars and the planets and the moon were in spheres, and these spheres would be rotating from east to west around Earth, and Earth was in the center of the universe. This is the so-called geocentric worldview. And some of you are uh, doing the discussions um, and quoting uh, certain passages of Bible in which Earth is supposed to be its foundation, its rock. Remember, if you remember the quote, uh, it's a beautiful quote in the Bible. But um, the, 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 the people who had the Bible in, in good steam in those days and were also stargazers, they interpreted that as if Earth were in the center of the universe, was the foundation, the rock, and everything else would go around, right? So if you think a lot uh, of good things about stars and planets, so you can see that all of them are kind of orbiting us, and us, Earth, happen to be in the center of the universe. So that was the first possible worldview that came about Earth in the center of the universe and all the other planets um, and the sun and the moon going around us from east to west. As west, as you can see, as you can see clearly in this simulation. Right? So just give the time pass by, 910, 940, 950, and we are in June 21st, and and slowly, slowly. Uh, Earth is observing this hypothetical celestial sphere going around. But what these ancient stargazers did, in addition to that, what they did was, well, let me map the sky and let uh, map the relative position of all the stars in respect to one another. Which means, I know, I know they didn't have the technology, but imagine they could take a picture of the sky, and then one day later, take a picture again, and then again, and then again, and then compare, and see how, if there are any differences. And I can simulate that in here. Look at that. So now, I'm going to advance time, one day at a time, almost one day. And then what you see is these stars don't move. Right? It's as if I were following the celestial, this hypothetical celestial sphere in those days. So the stars don't move, but look at the moon, look at the planets. They do move. And Saturn now retrogrades, moves from east to west, and Mars is prograding, going from west to east. So the prograde motion is a name associated with any type of motion or sky motion in which the object moves from west to east. And retrograde is when the opposite occurs, and, and Jupiter, in this case here, and Ceres is going from east to west. So they were retrograding. Now, uh, in Mesopotamia, this fact became part of their belief system and retrogression and progression uh, would be interpreted as if the god were somehow <laughs> by doing these changes causing some anomalies in people's lives or could produce that. So then you have a real astronomical event that you can observe uh, being incorporated into people's lives and moral codes um, in, par in part because, one, you observe, and second, uh, because you have a belief system. And the part of that belief system is to believe that um, this, the celestial sphere was harmonious, was perfect, was not subject to decay, and, and the gods were somehow communicating uh, things to us. So, these are the two major uh, types of motions, and um, and the geocentric worldview is is 
was um, explained by Ptolemy with uh, the cycles and F cycles and the different circles, which uh, your book uh, explains quite well. Let me bring here the, the PowerPoint. So if, if we try to bring this explanation from the point of view why planets prograde and retrograde from the point of view of a heliocentric worldview, the sun in the center, uh, is pretty much the result of uh, the inner planets taking over as it passes the outer planet. And then we see the outer planets kind of going backward. Uh, this is quite common in our solar system and is one of the Kepler's law, the fact that planets closer to the sun, they move at a faster speed um, than, than the planets that are further out. And then eventually the inner planets will take over. But the Ptolemy, Ptolemy uh, was a great mathematician and before uh, Copernicus he uh, produced this geocentric worldview, Earth in the center, not exactly in the center, it's kind of uh, off the center, but um, the planets would be describing an ape cycle as you can see in the smaller circle and this ape cycle also counterclockwise would uh, would be orbiting points in this major circle uh, named deferent and uh, they were quite successful in not only uh, explain planets configuration but also to predict planets positions in the sky okay and why it was so important to predict planets position in the sky because of astrology astrology in those days was uh, if you didn't have an astrology you couldn't marry your daughter so they is, is a belief system that was um, highly paid by the kings and and everyone had to, to have an astrology that's Copernicus now Galileo Galilei he uh, used the telescope to prove that um, the the, the uh, geocentric worldview that every single object in the solar system should go around the Earth uh, didn't didn't work. It, it, it couldn't hold water. And one of the major uh, observations he did that blow the idea that everyone has to go around the Earth was uh, the uh, phases of Venus. So when he, he observed Venus and saw Venus going through Gibbous phase. And, and it's showing this picture, uh, see the word gibbous? That is Venus in gibbous phase. For a, an object to go in gibbous phase, it has to be further out with respect to the sun. And in the geocentric worldview, this would never happen. And Galileo Galilei also, he observed uh, sunspots and other blemishes in the sun that couldn't uh, be explained by the geocentric worldview. So those are the main topics of chapter two. Um, if you wanna uh, take material or study it for your midterm, I recommend that you go to the end of the chapter and try to answer some of the questions that exist there. I will create multiple choice uh, versions of those questions and put in the exam. But also uh, a takeover exercise is you should have the ability of looking at the moon and determine the moon phase and um, and at what time that moon is is supposed to rise and set. Okay. Do you guys have any question? I actually have one question. Okay, about Jessica, go on. That. Yes. So those um on the modules, I think it's about like an astro pick or something. Yes. Um, what exactly do we need to submit? Um, I leave that one open. You, you don't need to submit anything. Um, it's, it's one of those that I give credit. It's sort of a, a golden extra credit because if you upload and if you can do in a nice way, and I explain how, uh, you get extra credits that are added to the overall thing after even extra credits are, are added. Uh, but basically, is you have to take a picture of an astronomical object 
upload it, and then you have to uh, describe what type of instrument you had and uh, when it was and what type of focal length your camera had, if you used or not any filter, or if you had or not any telescope associated with it, all of that has to be uh, uploaded. And also a description of the object, a physical description of it. Um, and what I would like to, uh, to foment is uh, the appreciation of celestial objects and the fact that we, in class, um, we are trying to uh, uh, purchase the technology that would enable us to, um, to do astrophotography in a very almost semi-professional way, uh, hopefully. Hey, Maria de Lourdes, how are you doing? I can see you. Does that make sense, Jessica? Yes, it does make sense. So but does that mean we can't just use our phones? We have to go... Ah, you can um, use your phones. You can use your phones through the telescope. I will... Um, I will... Or if you have a tripod that can keep the, the phone kind of stable, that would be good. But on July 20, we have a an observatory view, and you could join us, and then you could... Uh, take a picture using your cell phone. We have adapters, and then you can you can you can try to get some some nice picture. And in fact, in July twenty, the moon is going to be in the sky. Let's see, uh, I think it's the first quarter. Check a little there. Yeah, it should be close to the first quarter. What is my seven nine? Yeah, July twenty. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a first quarter. Who is this? Wow, the Jupiter right next to it. What a view. That's going to be something cool. Go to 9 o'clock. Or oh, July 20. July 20, moon and Jupiter. What a view. That's going to be quite something. That's stupid right there. Yeah. Any other question? I actually have another question. Yes. I'm sorry. No, you don't need to be sorry. So I noticed that we have, you, you wrote on there, we're going to have different duties, so not everything is due like on Sundays. It's, like something is due almost every day. Yes, uh, not not every day. Homeworks usually are due two or three days after they are supposed to be released. Um, yeah, extra credits in general. I think Friday and discussions. Uh, there are four, five of them, and they all start on Monday and they close on Saturday. So I have time to grade them. So we have to keep track. I mean, the best way to do, I think, is if you if you have your course, you can follow. You can follow through the modules, right? So if you go to, wait a sec, something is. So if you go to the modules, June 18, 19, you have the assessments there, mandatory assessments, and then you can figure out what it is. And it gives the due date right there, June 22, 20, 25th. And then you go to the third one, and then we, you know. So the dates are there, it's easy to see. Another way of doing is, and some students prefer that way, if you go to the course web page either in the right hand side or right below you have the to do things so in my case I have a bunch of uh, corrections that I have to do um, but it also lists the com coming up uh, assessments that are supposed to be closed June 22nd is tomorrow June 22nd is tomorrow June 23rd is Saturday so discussions are closed on Saturday. All of them are closed on Saturday. 
and extra credits are closed on, on Fridays. Okay. Now the last one is the calendar. If you if you take the calendar, the calendar will give you the due date, and that's not a good thing because sometimes you might not have time to to do it. Um, and I can't see the calendar here for some reason. I think my configuration is not good. But you should be able to. Okay. So I think the best way is uh, is through modules and the to do thing, the to do list. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Very good. So, any other question? Uh, I have a question. Yes, Victor. Um, so, I was trying to find the little Zoom thing you did yesterday. Yes. And I'm, I'm not sure where to find it. Do I go oh. to the modules or? Yeah. So, yesterday, so that is the night uh, here. The twentieth chat six twenty eighteen on top okay. two two point two and then you click on it should go through. Oh. And then again. Cool. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to make it public because YouTube would not automatically make it public. So if you can access just let me know. Yeah, it's right there. All right. Good evening, everybody. Oh, my goodness. You're going to want to hear me twice. All right. And then navigation is going fine for most of you. I think I was a little bit confused at the beginning because if you see like how it was 2.4, 2.3, but those are just links that stuff that we should view. Yeah. But the ones with the dates are actual assignments we need to turn in. Correct? That's that's correct. Yes, yes. Uh, this um, um, order 2.5, 2.6, 2. In fact, this should be 2.8, and this 2.9. I had to fix it. Uh, is recommended by by distance education at Evergreen as a way to facilitate communication between you guys and professors. Like if something is not working, you say, hey, this um, the simulation simulator 2.4 is not is not opening. Can you please check it? Or how about the extra credit 2.7? I cannot access the link that is uh, indicated. It's easier to facilitate communication. Thank you. All right. But I think you guys are doing fine. Uh, I know it's, it's a lot of information, and uh, but just take your time. A little bit here, a little bit there. I know homework can be all over the place sometimes because I am in the process of trimming the, uh, the questions and make the questions adaptable to the book that I'm using now. And uh, this homework I have been using from with questions from different publishers, and and you might feel overwhelmed with uh, too many things that might not uh, be easily found in your chapter book. But um, so, but homework, this homework, this quiz over here, I will open um, the last two weeks in uh, towards the summer. I will open them. And then you can do again, and by then uh, you will have a little bit more of uh, understanding of the overall situation and course, and then you can do it better. But homework also is not a lot of points. It's 2.5% of your course grade. So it's not a big deal. From, uh, that the, was going to be one of my other questions. Um, say it again, Jessica. 
I was just going to ask if you accepted any late work, for example, if for whatever reason we lose track of time or something. Uh, and, in, like, in, in general, no. Or I'm going to be a, in a nightmare. Because once I close, uh, if some oh, I miss, and then I have to open for that person, it's complicated. Uh, that's why there are due dates, and that's why I set extra credit. And I know it's complicated. I know it's complicated, but try as much as possible to keep track of what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Maria de Lourdes is, yes, is, is the one before. Uh, the, the chat room that has, that has a, a question, it is right here, this one. So, let's see if you go to the extra credit right here. Then you can submit. One more question here, wait a second. Oh, you submit the extra credit yesterday? Yeah, and I already graded. You submitted an uh, you submitted an ex extra credit yesterday. Was the W first? And I think I already graded. And I send it. Um, and you should be able to receive an uh, alert that the grade was posted. And Maria de Lourdes, you need to know, you, you are sending a chat privately, but uh, uh, every, this is open to the entire class, right? So I, I don't think you mind, but I just need you to know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember correcting yours, and I already read it. You went fine. You got it all right. Two point seven extra credit. Let me see. Two point seven extra credit. Oh, is that that extra credit? Um, it should have a a link. Didn't I put a link? Uh, two point six. Oh yes, yes, yes. Just upload, um, write a, a paragraph and make a description of your dark energy. No, the, the discussion of the cultural background, uh, Maria de Lourdes, the discussion of a cultural background is done here, 1.8. So you go to module, topic one, through to through the universe and is it was open on Monday click here and then you can post your solution your discussion right you can either reply to uh, authors or you can go all the way to the end and then you can upload your answer, okay?
Okay, I will stop taping now.